Hello, my name's Derek Bailey. I've been a wood turner now for over 40 years and the last eight of him I've been teaching. Although those days have gone now, I think. Uh, what I want to introduce to you today is uh, a cryptex. It's basically a safe and it was used in the uh, Da Vinci Code starring Tom Hanks. Uh, it's not quite a, as elaborate as the one in the film but I think it looks quite nice. Uh, this is uh, the one I made ooh, about 12 months ago, something like that, and I thought I'd introduce it again uh, in the video. It's got different design on the outside, which, uh, which you obviously you can use your own designs, and that become apparent as, uh, as the video goes on. Uh, <clears throat> what is essentially how it works is you rotate the dials, and the sleeve comes out. And inside the sleeve you can put various documents, jewellery, uh, puzzles, uh, any, anything that's possibly expensive or something like that. And you can use it in the game. Uh, I should imagine that you know if you have a Christmas game or a birthday game where you leave clues around the house etc. And then it cracks the code and, in, and when you crack the code there's a prize inside. Um, from what I can gather, a lot of the cryptexes that have been made by wood turners, etc., have, have just had one code. So that uh, without changing the dials again and, and introducing new letter systems and that sort of thing, once you've cracked the code, that's it. Well, with this one, I've, I've made it quite easy so that you can change the combination on them. So that you get a repeatability without going to a lot of extent in trying to change the dials, etc. I've used in the video quite uh, cheap timber, which is mahogany. Uh, I thought if I can use cheap timber, then hopefully anybody can do it. Because ideally you want hard timbers when you, it's a precise item. So you want precise diameters and precise faces that are flat and, and square. So that when they, when they come together, there's no gaps between mating components. But I've used soft mahogany and it's turned out okay, I've, uh, especially when I've sprayed it with lacquer, etc. Uh, it's, uh, it's come up quite well, as you hopefully you'll see in the video. There's lots of scope to improve the design. This isn't a hard and fast rule. It's up to you what, what timbers you want to use, what, what your budget allows. But I got a lot of uh, enjoyment out of it and I hope you will too. And I hope you find the video interesting. Uh, if you do, subscribe and uh, hopefully we'll get some more videos. Anyway, enough waffling, let's get on. Due to my uh, essential tremors, I find it hard to use the straight tipped of the carbide tip tools. Uh, the one tip I haven't got is a slightly radiused uh, tip, which is far easier to do for a straight turning and facing off. It's less grabby. Well, rather than pay for the expense of another tip, I'd prefer to go back to my normal traditional tools and use the spindle roughing gouge. By using this bevel as a fulcrum, I can gently introduce the cutting edge to the wood, whereas the carbide tipped tool cuts the wood straight away and is very unforgiving of a shaking hand. I 
as you can see I rest the bevel onto the wood first and by raising the handle introduce the cutting edge to the wood. Uh, once I see uh, chips forming at the cutting edge I simply move my body with my arms pressed permanently against my body so that I don't move the arms independently and that I can generate a constant cut throughout the length of the timber. To save time in measuring the optimal size of the jaws I'm using, I've made templates for all the different styles of jaws for this particular chuck. It saves a lot of time and I put super glue on the edges to reduce the wear. I'm now making a straight tenon about uh, 4 millimeters long using the template and then to finish I just create a slight dovetail by angling the parting tool to give that dovetail shape which can be gripped firmly in the chuck. Now I've turned the, uh, the mahogany to roughly to size it's time to make the first part of the cryptex which is the indexing bush first I've got to make the face of it perfectly flat or slightly convex I don't want any rocking which I'm testing with the rule here because the lathe is quite uh, underpowered well when I say underpowered it's uh, a one-third horsepower motor which isn't very strong I need to drill the holes with forstner bits in two stages using a smaller forstner bit first. I'm going to make five indexing bushes so the bores of those bushes have to be consistent so I use the same procedure in drilling each of the uh, bushes independently uh, using the same forstner bits. Using the circle I've just drawn I'm going to use a brad point drill 4 millimeters diameter and drill 10 equispaced holes around the circle I've just made using the uh, indexing jig I made in a previous video. I used a brad hole to uh, pierce the uh, circle the penciled circle uh, because it's hard to sight the uh, brad the point of the brad all drill to do the same the 10 holes are going to be roughly 4 millimeters diameter obviously it all depends on what size you want to drill your holes if you do undertake this this uh, cryptex. In order to ensure a consistent depth through all the holes I've set the uh, a gap between the tip of the drill jaws and the gap between the edge of the indexing post which is a 10 millimeter gap which should give me a consistent depth through all the holes that I drill.
as you can see I'm now turning a 10 10 millimeters wide down to half the intersection of the previously drilled holes so I've got 10 grooves 4 millimeters diameter by 2 millimeters deep And now I part off to the width of the flange, which is about four millimeters. When I parted off at the four millimeter flange width, I had to make sure that the back of the flange and the front of the bush were slightly convex uh, in order to maintain uh, a good contact between all the bushes as it's assembled later on. In fact all contacting faces with the dial, the bushes etc need to ha have a good contact so have to be slightly convex so that all the edges, the top edges of the circumference are flush fitting. I'm going to make a recess in the back of the bush uh, which will go over the top of the pins as, uh, as it's indexed. So I have to reverse the uh, indexing bush and it won't fit on, it, well it will fit on the jaws but the jaws are too long and I'll be turning metal instead of wood so I've had to make a jam chuck to accept the, to accept the bush within the bore. The indexing bush was a little bit slack on the uh, jam chuck so I've just altered the jam chuck a little bit more to make it a tighter fit. Because this mahogany is quite soft and light it does tend to fray a little bit on any precision cutting so I'm having to clear out the glue grooves with a chisel to make them more accessible to the pin that will go in them. A spray sanding sealer and a couple of coats of spray malamine. I'm having to go back to my indexing jig in order to create a groove in the bore of the bush so that the bush can uh, bridge the pins as it slides over the uh, shaft of the uh, cryptex. I'm using a 4mm drill to mark the position of the groove and I'll simply file out that groove or cut it out with a hacksaw blade or something like that just to, to give it a square edge. I'm just making sure that I position the groove in between two of the circular indexing grooves. I don't want them in a line with each other so I'm, I'm making the groove in the middle of, of the gap between the two indexing circular grooves above.
I'm now making the capping ring which is identical procedure to the indexing rings except it's a slightly thinner and doesn't have the indexing grooves on the top of the uh, tenon. I'm just making three uh, equispaced holes round the tenon to accept screws that will screw into the shaft of the uh, Cryptex to hold the whole assembly together. I'm just measuring the pitch circle diameter on the indexing bush and I'll reproduce that diameter for the dial uh, where I can drill the uh, four one four millimeter diameter hole for the dial pin. I'm using a larger forstner bit to remove most of the wood in the bore and then finish off to the correct bore size using a carbide tipped tool. I'm parting off the dial slightly larger than uh, 10 millimeters wide to allow for any uh, errors and I'll make the two flush with the uh, indexing bush at a later stage. I've chosen a smaller set of jaws for the chuck because I want to grip the bore itself on the sleeve. Uh, in doing so, I can, I, I, there's more chance of the bore, as, as I'm drilling from both sides of the wood, the, the force and bit isn't long enough to go all the way through. Uh, I have to drill from either end of the sleeve, so I want to, to be able to line the entrances of both bores 
up pretty well so that's why I'm gripping on the bore itself using the uh, outside of the jaws. The key sleeve diameter will slide inside the bore of the uh, locking sleeve. So therefore I'm sizing the outside diameter of the key sleeve to the Forstner bit I'm going to use to bore out the locking sleeve. Here I'm using a screw chisel to finish off the uh, outside diameter of the locking sleeve. It gives a far better finish and it's easier to make a, a, a straight diameter along the length of the wood. I'm going to use a spade bit to bore out the wood this time uh, just as a test to see if it's okay. It does have a long point to it so you will be left with a hole at the bottom of the uh, of the sleeve 
but that can help and you line it up in a later process of sanding and fitting the thing together uh, it does make a heck of a noise but it works quite well Here I'm just skimming off the front of the uh, locking sleeve uh, to take away the ragged edge. I'm just testing the key sleeve to see if it slides into the locking sleeve. It's a little bit tight but a little bit of sandpaper later on will soon rectify that problem. I'm just finishing off the locking sleeve so that the indexing bush slides over the top quite freely. Notice I'm using uh, my favourite jam chuck to hold the uh, sleeve. Due to the thin wall section of the uh, sleeve, it saves uh, risking splitting or, or compressing the tube too far using the uh, four jaw chuck. Seeing these as sliding parts, I'm putting a, a sanding sealer and two coats of malamine. Uh, the malamine hardens over time and, and reduces wear. My previous uh, Cryptex had uh, end caps which was a little bit boring and I wanted to vary the design so I looked at my favourite book of shapes to decide on what style I wanted the end caps. If you noticed I flipped the parting tool onto its side and used the corner to make a scour mark to stop it the edge from fraying as I use the round nosed tip scraper.
I got a bit fed up with my essential tremors starting to affect the movement of the carbide tip tool so I've reverted to my good old spindle gouge to create a smoother curve on the surfaces. Now for a spot of copy turning as I duplicate the style onto the locking sleeve end cap. Because the wood is sticking out for a fair distance from the chuck jaws I was getting a little bit of vibration so I introduced the tail stock to overcome this. A 
If I was doing a, a production turn and I was making a series of these shapes, I'd put a masking tape onto the tool rest uh, and <coughs> fix the tool rest in position and put salient marks on the, on the masking tape where I would plunge in the parting tool and have various calipers set at the different diameters required. Notice when I do the sweeping curve, my body moves and my arms and hands are fixed to my body. It, this generates a smooth curve and helps me to control the same thickness of cut as it travels along the wood. If you've noticed I've got some vibration marks on the on the curve so I had to go to the grinder and reshop my spindle gouge. When you're copy turning, ideally you want to get uh, the width proportions correct. So it's a case of keep uh, taking a little bit off and then checking, taking some more off and checking, and then gradually working your way along the length of the uh, of the item, and then finish turn at the end. Well that's the end caps done, uh, just a little bit of uh, a sandpaper onto the sleeve and I'm sure I can get the two slided together nicely. Thanks for watching, see you in part two as I finish the assembly of the Cryptex.